Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming. It's amazing. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jessica Shaw. I'm so happy to be sitting here for Unfiltered. Pamela Adlon embraces better things. I am um, a huge fan, as I'm sure you all are, of Pamela's creator, writer, director, star, producer, general goddess um, of better things. And I think one of the reasons I know I love this show so much is because we all watch a lot of TV. At least I do. I feel like ever I'm constantly watching television. And you watch it, you metabolize it, you move on with your life. And this show is we like you change your DVR to say keep forever. Mm. It's not a delete after however many weeks. And it's a re I see people nodding. It's one that you rewatch. And it's one that, like a favorite book or like a beautiful photograph or something, it's something that, that I feel like every time I watch it, I take something else away. That's and amazing. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're going to get through this. We are. We are. So I guess I was start, wanted to start just asking you as you approach this season, what was your, do you think about your seasons as like a theme that you want to have running through it? Um, you know, I, I, this season in particular, I wanted it to be about change. Um, you know, and I wanted, I, I saw, you know, I mean, there's such changes that go in, on in our lives all the time. And for me, I see, I see the change daily because I, of my daughters, you know, and my mom who are like my husband, I guess. All of my daughters and my mom are my husband. Um, but so I, I see it through them and I, and I kind of wanted it to uh, be, you know, uh, everybody's kind of unraveling a little bit. Um, but in that, you see people gaining strength. So it's, you know, I, I feel like the show strength exists in its scar tissue, you know, and how that toughens you. Yeah, I mean, I, the season starts with Sam in her closet, just like trying to find the pair of jeans that fits or the shirt and whatever. And I thought, you know, here you are, not to be a like Pamela Adlon hashtag brave, you know, but here you are saying, I'm telling truth, vanity be damned. Yeah. Well, I didn't think I looked that bad, but everybody's also, like- Also, you look amazing, you know. You're so fucking brave. I'm like, go, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but yeah, you know, it, so I have this, this show right now. And this is my conduit for creativity. And I'm able to um, kind of show this awful thing that happened to me that made Greta Garbo retreat to her apartment for the last part of her life because she changed so much. And how, how sad is that, that we're not embracing those things? And so once I finished taking a knee after my shit didn't fit me in the closet anymore, I was like, bro, what's happening? Like, I mean, these pants that looked so good on me three months before. And so it, it helps because, you know, I, I don't know it, who here is near my age, but like, you know, you go through your life and every day you're looking in the mirror and you're like, no visible resting lines, looking pretty good, you know? <laughs> like all that terminology and then one day you're like, oh fuck, that's my neck now? They're all like, it'll never happen to me. You're like, <laughs> damn it. You know, two fingers, I just do this, I like just a little bit of tape. They haven't, got, they haven't had the technology yet to do what I need. So I think my neck started falling literally the day I started shooting my own television show. Yes. I noticed it because I was like, I was driving in the car, I was like, what is, I looked good up until now. <laughs> and now I have a show. So you can't time these things out. But once you get past that, there's, there's a huge amount of uh, strength in overcoming being self-conscious um, and you know once you get past that 
And you know, other people are living in that and it, it's painful. You know, it's painful for them or it's painful if, you know, I mean, I have kids, they don't like people to comment on them, especially my youngest. They, they don't want people to say, you look pretty, you look, you look this, you got taller, you, just don't fucking say anything. Hey, hi, you want a bagel? That's it. They don't want it, right. things to be pointed out, you know? You've got a pulse, move on. Exactly, yeah. exactly, we're all here. Yeah. Um, so when you get past being self-conscious and you gain confidence, that for me has been the biggest uh, hat trick for, of my show. Um, that I learned in season one, the ability to make decisions and be confident in your choices um, is what has seen me through making 32 episodes of this show. It's, and for Pamela and also for Sam, I feel like, she's yeah. kind of, the decisions she makes, she just, she commits to them. I mean, there's a great moment, I think it was in last week's episode, where she says to the mom of the bully kid, she was like, I want to go outside and beat you up, whatever. And it's this great moment of she's just like, and of course it ends up unraveling and backfiring, but yeah. but it's a great moment. Very satisfying. Of, yeah, it was very Because I can live my life through these moments, you know? If something uh, happened to one of my kids or their friends or me when I was a kid, I can live vicariously through Sam. I say that Sam is like me in a cape because she's like the ultra version of me, she she says the things that I want to say. Um, she she goes the extra mile. She you know I know things are going to be okay. I mean it's like I'm able to. Uh, it's it's therapy. It's basically FX is paying for my therapy. <laughs> Um, well, one of the things, you know, the closet scene, we just saw the colonoscopy prep, which they're just indignities of life that, that the show portrays. And yet there's something so inherently positive about Sam, no matter what's going on. And we'll see various things over the course of the season. And I was wondering how you thread that needle, because often I think someone can write something that's like, oh God, this, this like crappy thing happened in life and then it right. just becomes all about that. Well, I, I, what, what I, I like dark humor, I, it's my favorite and I like, I like things that are uh, uncomfortable but I don't like nihilistic comedy. I don't, I, I, there, it can't have, it can't be darkness with no heart so it's like, um, I, I like a little clearing in the clouds. But I also like, you know, there's this terminology, I don't know if anybody here skis or is a mountain snow person, but if you're, if you're in the mountains and you, know, you wanna hit powder from up high and you see a little blue sky in the clouds, that's called a sucker hole. And so when you go and you're gonna ski that mountain, that hole's gonna close and all of a sudden you're in an avalanche. And so I like that too. I like the heart, but I like the sucker holes. So I like telling the story. I like the nice moment. And then I like going over here a little bit. You know, I like to, I like to sit with the characters and see them taking in when other people are, are talking. I like listening and I like the air. Um, uh, and those are the things that uh, inspire me. When you were creating this show, what was the, were there things that you looked to, whether like, I don't know, any, a piece of art or, or another show or something that you felt like, oh, this is, I want this kind of feeling? You know, I, it was literally cobbled together. And it was from, I, I, I just knew that I wanted to use for example, the orchestral version of Clouds, the Joni Mitchell song. Um, and I didn't know if I could get it. I would start getting very um, married to music cues um, in my show that I had no idea if I could get them or not. Like, I wrote Only Women Bleed. I named it Only Women Bleed. I wrote the song into the script and we were in production already and then we found out that we got the song. We had to pay for it, but... <laughs> Um, so it's music that, that are my inspirations. It's, it's people, it's characteristics, 
It's um, the art that I've been collecting my whole life. It's, um, you know, it's, the, uh, it's a certain way of dressing. It's a certain timelessness. Um, I want it to last. I want my show to be everlasting. And I, I, don't, I, I didn't want to put time stamps when I was creating the look. I said I want it to feel like it could be at any era, except the only thing that sets it apart is everybody's got a cell phone, you know, right. or something like that. But I didn't want to put any kind of uh, time stamp on it um, in any way like that. It's interesting you say that because it is very timeless, and yet a show about a woman between you know 45 50 around 55 whatever is is the opposite of uh, it's almost like it happens at no time you know in in our culture and mm -hmm. it almost feels like this show by virtue of existing is in some ways like an act of rebellion because i think that in culture people in pop culture especially people don't know what to do with women, you're not, yeah. you know, you're not the object of someone else wanting us to, you know, necessarily or your, your sole purpose. No, I'm basically invisible. Right. That that was my pitch to FX originally, and after um, I'd submitted my my pilot script, um, I got John Langraff called me and he said, okay, basically, um, this is your dime. I want you to tell me about your show, the world of your show, uh, because this was before I had a pickup. And I told him, I said, I want to see somebody like me. I haven't, I've never seen somebody like me on television, you know? Um, I, you know, women of my age, we're invisible. We literally could go and rob a fucking bank and <laughs> nobody would be like, nobody would even be looking at us because they're looking at my fucking daughters. So it's like, yeah. I mean, you That's just season had four. the best plot for a robbery now. Yeah, you know? I know. But it's, it, you know, it, it's an amazing thing because I wanted to elevate the mundane because I look at it kind of in a whimsical way. This is the way I look at my life, um, the, w the way I um, do my show. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, I've said that I should be in the dollar bin at the Jewish Council thrift store. Like, why do, <laughs> you know, I'm Tootsie. <laughs> I'm the toast of the town. But really, it's like, it's an amazing story because, you know, there's, no, there's nothing, um, I was going to say sexy about a, a lady, a small, smallening, Jewish, oldening lady. But I made it cool again. Or for the first time. That was awful. <laughs> I wanted. Well, I, I mean, I do think that there is a certain luxury that um, m m creators of culture, that male creators of culture have been afforded as far as being able to just write about thinking or being or, like you say, like just the everyday life things that I think mm -hmm. women creators don't get, aren't afforded that luxury. I think a woman has to have a, uh, a clear plot. And, you know, some of my favorite moments on this show or sometimes watching Sam process something going on and not knowing exactly where she's thinking because yeah. she doesn't have a black or white thought about whatever is transpiring, she's in the gray. And I think that that's something, sadly, but it is something that feels radical. Well, it, yes, it, it is. It's radical to people for, for somebody to not say, oh, this is what's happening now. Why is she acting this way? Why is he behaving this way? Um, why do you explain all the weird idiosyncratic things that we do on the show, like touch the statue, or why do they spit toy toy toy? Why do they, you know? Um, I like toy 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 because I grew up with poo poo poo. Oh, okay, so, yeah. yeah. Or too too too. Yeah. <laughs> but besides all of those things, it's, it's, it's really my, my, my network, I say this, 
you know, and it's not lip service. It's it's my collaboration with FX. They literally gave me uh, the freedom to do this and took this chance on me and they let me have this space and they give me notes. They're like, okay, when Sam gets up and, and walks away from Xander, her ex-husband at the restaurant, we don't want to stay with Xander. We want to leave with Sam because that's, and, and I you know, take the note and then I keep it the way I had it. And then, <laughs> You know what in the room right now, right? She's like, I know, bitch. <laughs> but the amazing thing is that they have given me this freedom to tell the story in this way. And so when Sam leaves the bar, when she's sitting with Gay Ray in the bar, and he's saying, oh, we, we, we didn't have the cur We couldn't be gay. We couldn't be openly gay at that time or anything. And then Sam leaves, and then you stay you stay with Ray and he's sitting there and it's just a moment that would be just fat that somebody would cut off. But that's, that's what I love. I love sitting there and seeing people's lives. And it's not just about Sam Fox. It's about the people in the world. Yeah. The people that, that make up her world and, and mm -hmm. just and that world in general. This season, you ran a writer's room and you hired some new writers, and I was wondering how you approached putting that together. I know you've spoken that you, that you, you and Phil Rosenthal, obviously the legendary producer and creator, um, he gave you some inspiring words. I don't know if you can share those, but tell well, me he about said, that. He said to me, he said, being in a writer's room is the most unlonely feeling you can have. And I just, hi from the hall, I remember you guys. <laughs> Um, you know, and it was, I kind of had a very anti-writer's room mentality for myself as a writer because I was afraid of it. You know, I grew up, my father was a writer. He wrote by himself until the end of his life. Then he had only one partner. I've only written with one partner besides myself. I never knew uh, how to be in a writer's room, let alone run a writer's room. And so, um, you know, I started getting submissions of all women writers, and I said, you got to send me men writers, too, because I want to think and write in a, um, a non-gendered way, in a gender-neutral way. And so in my room this year, I had two men, two women, and two of them were playwrights. And um, one of the guys in the room, I was like, I was like, Ira, you're writing with a penis in your head. You got to get it out of your head. And then I'd be like, you know, put the penis in your head to the women, you know. <laughs> Can somebody do a drawing of one? <laughs> like a rebus or something? Um, but, you know, have everything in your head. It's like. You know, I have Frankie say in next week's episode, you guys are so binary, you know, and how it's, you know, my kids and their generation, they hate that, that, you know, they have so much disdain for being binary. And um, th that's the way I, I want to write. It's just like in a non-binary way. And so we were able to talk and tell stories and just go down roads and, you um, and then, you know, I put my inspirations on the board and I knew that I wanted to um, What do... were your inspirations? Like words or? Yes. Uh -huh. or, like I, or just colonoscopy. I just put it up there. I was like, it I'm is doing inspiring. one. Yes. But I, I knew I wanted to have all needle drops this season. And I wasn't going to have a composer. I, I knew it was all the music that just haunts me that goes in my head. <clears throat> that that's my inspiration. I knew I wanted to put mandolin wind, um, and then uh, you know the fact that I got it every single time I get one of those cues. It 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 makes me so happy because it pushes my show forward. And you know, and then I added some new art to the walls, and you know, I mean, this is all the stuff that inspires me is music, art, and then I hear stories, and then. You know, um, I, I have, uh, you know, I put trans people in my show and I don't point it out. Right. Um, they just populate my show and nobody ever knows where they are. You know, it's, it's massively important to me. 
um, to, uh, to show the diversity of the world um, in which I live in and my kids live in. And, um, and, you know, I mean, on my show, we have, I guess, probably 60% women or something like that, or maybe close to 70. And uh, eight of my department heads are women. I'm three of them. <laughs> and um, you're you, every woman. Yes. But the thing, the thing is also something that I've been talking to people about is, you know, um, everybody's like ringing this bell of, um, you know, inclusion and 50-50 by 2020 and all these different massive slogans. But the problem is that when I went through each uh, phase of my show, prep, production, post, editorial, sound, I look at everything and I'm like, where are all the women here? Where are all the people of color here? It doesn't exist. So I ask my sound engineer, I'm like, are there any women that you know who run sound, who do the sound mix of a show? It's like non-existent. Yep. Uh, you're trying to find female editors. That's difficult enough. An editor who's a person of color, it's almost impossible. I didn't want to do my show without a female key grip this season. There's like four. This is the coolest job in the world to have. And I just think that people aren't aware of what the jobs are. So I'm saying we need to educate people about what the jobs are that are available. The focus puller, the, the best boy, you, you know, I mean, the, my sound utility is a woman. It's amazing to have an all-female sound department. And so I just wish that people could find out more about that. So anyway, go to my... <laughs> well, no, it's, it, it is really important, I think, because... I don't have a platform. I'm just well, I'm no, trying to make something good happen out of all... It, of because when people say, whatever it is, 50% women directors at a certain point, it's like, you have to bring up those women in all the departments, because you don't just all of a sudden you're directing a Marvel movie. Yeah. You have to be... you Like, where's the women DPs? Where's the... You know, so yeah, That's I think right. it's really it's important that... that the people young are people need to know what there is. They go, I want to be an actor or a director or a studio executive. And it's like there's so there's so much more that there is. It's just that people need to they should put it in schools or high schools or something. Yeah. Uh, you were talking anyway, about I gotta go. <laughs> you were talking about the music um, on the show. What's the one song that you're like, oh, still dying to get that you haven't been able to use yet? Well, the Lou Reed stuff is tough. I I've, I've been try. I mean, I was. I, I mean, I had Lou Reed in my pilot. It's when, you know, Duke touches me and, and she makes me fall asleep. Um, and I just couldn't get the Lou Reed cue. I, I can't get the cues, but I was able to get Lori Anderson. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's hard to get, you can't get the old school hip hop cues because they've sampled the fuck out of everybody else's music. And so it's like publishing and licensing. And so it's almost untouchable. Um, you know, the, four, the music from the 40s is, is the most expensive in the world. So, um, and then, you know, of course, Lou Reed, of course, David Bowie, all of that stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's getting closer. I got a mandolin win this season. Yes, you did. So. Yeah, yes, you did. And didn't you, did you, is this true? I heard that you wrote like an eight page letter to Yoko Ono to get mother. I did. Did I she did. ever write back to you? She, she didn't write back, but, and I kind of thought she never saw it, but I was told that she wouldn't have approved it. So I sent her a video package of the colonoscopy scene. <laughs> I hadn't done that yet. <laughs> But I sent her like three cold opens, and then I sent her the woman is the something of the something episode. Yeah. And and then I wrote her this letter about how I took my kids to see Plastic Ono Band in like 2010. And I said, it was amazing because you were playing chess on stage with the RZA for like 20 minutes. <laughs> and, and the audience comes in and they're all shifting uncomfortably. And they were just playing chess. You know, and every once in a while, like, the RZA would go like this, and the audience would giggle, like, that was supposed to be funny. No, they're fucking playing chess. It's Yoko Ono and the RZA. It, and, and then they were playing her film, so there's, like, a fly 
uh, flying around a nipple, and it's one of Yoko's films from like the 60s. And everybody's looking at me like, how could you let your daughters see a nipple with a hair on it and a fly that Yoko Ono fucking filmed in the 60s? And I'm like, so I put all of that in the letter. And then I got the cue. It costs a lot of money though, but it was worth it. Yeah, it, well, it's so perfect. It's, it's funny because it's such a melancholy uh, song. Oh, it's incredibly and sad. And it's so, yeah, and it's, um, it, it's, it's a funny introduction to the show because it, yep. it's perfect, but it's also, um, you know, about a mother, I mean, Sam Fox is the ultimate always there. She's yeah. the opposite of the mother in the song. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I did just kind of love it. What what was the most challenging scene for you, do you think, to either to direct or to act in? Well, whew, everything. <laughs> I mean, it's all it's all very challenging because we are uh cross boarding. So uh when you're cross boarding, you don't do anything linear. So I'm shooting 10 to 13 pages a day. I do one episode in four days. Um, we do pieces of up to eight episodes in a day. So I'll be like, uh, okay, so I'll change. And where was I? This just happened. Try to get into the head of what, what you just did. Then I've got the new actors coming in. I want to make them feel comfortable. Um, certainly there's the big ones like the dance um, you know, and keeping that all a secret from uh, Max on the show and that building the, the stage. Of season two. Finale of two. One of the <clears throat> greatest moments, and I felt like, and I'm sure many of you had this experience too, you're watching it and you're laughing hysterically, like, like your jaws dropped in awe and you're crying. It was just, it's a real like, yeah. cycle of emotion. I mean, the, dan the dance is unbelievable because people tell me they watch it to, to make themselves feel better and it, it uplifts them and I think that's amazing. But the show to me is the scene where Max is standing in the middle of the living room and her village is a semicircle behind her and they all just say, I'll take her. I can't even talk about it. Kills me. Um, <clears throat> next. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> I made her cry. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, it, I'm fine now. Anyway, that's the scene to me because, um, you know, for me as a single mom and, um, you know, just getting through that every day with three girls. I don't have three kids, I have three girls. <laughs> so um, that is just not for the weak of heart. It's gnarly. So <laughs> when, when you get through the gnarl, it's amazing, it's, it's so worth it. And so th those are the left turns. So when everybody says, I'll take her, I'll take her, and I'm like, see, you got your, you, anything you want. And she looks at me and she says, mom, you're the best mom in the world, which kill, fucking kills. Everybody's dead, dead on the floor. Everybody's dying. And then she goes, but I want to go with Rich. <laughs> that's, the, that's the moment for me. I wanted to ask you about next week's episode, and you've got all these fun guest stars. Bernie Coppell is in it. I was like, Doc. I know. I love Mo Doc. Sharon Stone is in it. Yep. Like, how do you put together your guest stars that you want to? Um, it's usually people who grab me and say, "Put me in your show." Uh -huh. <laughs> so and then I go, "Okay, I gotta put Sharon Stone in this show." No, did she say that? I met Sharon Stone at the Golden Globes. And she threw so much love and support in my direction. And I was like, who is this fucking beautiful unicorn? I couldn't even believe it. I was like, Sharon motherfucking Stone. I, I was going out of my mind. And so we were just talking and she threw her digits at me as the ladies are wont to do <laughs> at the end of the Globes. And so I had her in my mind in the writer's room and then, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a perfect balance. You'll see the character that she plays. And then I knew I wanted to have a scene with um, some altacockers, you know, who were 
my dad's cronies. And I really wanted a black guy to speak Yiddish. And so these were all the things Mission that were- Mission accomplished. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and then I got Glenn Turman um, and, and Nicholas Coster and Mary Jo Catlett. The most amazing thing is, while we're sitting there and doing the scene, we realize Glenn and Nicholas Coster were in the uh, inner city arts, which was the first integrated theater in California. 50 years ago, they did a play. Wow. And then Glenn tells me that he originated the role of Travis in Raisin in the Sun on Broadway. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, that's how I start my season. Yeah. But those are the better things things, like these things that happen. And he said he grew up with James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry. And then when they were going to do the movie of the, of the book, he flew to LA the next year and he said, I grew a foot and I had a mustache. And they were like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't get to be in the movie. Wow. How was it directing Sharon Stone, by the way? Um, she was she was amazing. She yeah. she just she's was like, so good in the episode. She's like if this girl who loves my show walked into the set of my show, she like oh look at all the painting. So I had I just filmed her reaction to <laughs> this is so beautiful. Yeah, she was she was so easy and it was fun too because Kevin Pollock plays my brother and it was like a little casino reunion. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god, I didn't even think of that. that That's nice. right. That's awesome. What is your what is your writing style? Like, are you a kind of wake up at 4 a.m., like two hours before your kids are up and just put your ideas down? Are you a, like, write in your notes on your notes app? Well, I do, I do notes. I do journals, all of that stuff. But um, you have to give yourself some kind of discipline, you know? So um, for me, it has to be the, the first part of the day. I'm not, there's nothing good's gonna happen later um, <laughs> at all. But um, yeah, so, you know, if you, you know, everybody goes, you get up, you work out, you go to an office, you go to a clean space, you play Seek Chance or Brian Eno or a Bon Iver. Like these were the, this was the music I played for myself. Bon Iver, really? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't get him. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted him so bad for a cue, but um, he inspired me. Um, and if you're in a space, you can't have your computer, you can't have your phone near you. Nothing's ever gonna happen. You just have to clear your mind and then you can take out your journals, your, your drafts folders, your, your little notebooks, your little brain bits, like my dad used to call them. And you know, it, it's important for me to be not in a cluttered space, in a space that's a dedicated um, sanctuary. I want to ask you, speaking of your dad, uh, Sam's ghost dad is, is a prominent part this season. Um, and we'll, I'm trying to remember, I've seen the whole season, so how much you all have seen so far. Um, he was only in the pilot okay, for a so, second. Okay, so uh, what was that decision like to, to do that? And I understand the actor is like, looks just like, uh, you know, yeah. 70. Yeah, well, um, Adam Kolbersch is the actor. Uh, and so when I had to make uh, my dad for the pilot, I called my friend Zoe Hay, who it, she was the Merkin maker on Masters of Sex. And I said, <laughs> You gotta That's make some- That's the best business card thing. <laughs> so she, I said, can you make my dad, this guy look like my dad, the facial hair. So she, she went, she met him in a park and she like measured his face. And so I really recreated like my dad from the seventies with the big collars and, and all of that. Like, I mean, the story goes that his friends hated his clothes so much they burned him in a big garbage can. <laughs> So, um, which is probably why he was so tortured, one of the reasons, and why he is my muse, you know, because I lost my dad when he was 60. Um, and, uh, you know, he was trying to, he was doing all kinds of things at the end of his life. He's the first person I ever heard use the term reinvent yourself. And so um, it's, it's, it's not lost on me that at the age that my dad was when work started drying up for him as a writer, 
because of ageism, my life just exploded outward as a writer, director, producer, actor. Um, it, it's, it's unbelievable, and it's, it's, it's like a, I'm living his legacy. Yeah, I mean, that must, well, can you imagine if you had told your, I mean, you've been working in this industry since you were, what, nine, ten years old? If you had told, like, teenage you or 20-something you was probably going out on auditions, like, listen, you're going to have this massive success, critical and creative, and, you know, you're going to be on FX, and, and, and when, when you're 50 or 40, I don't know how old you were when you made the show, but, what, and, you know. You know what, I feel like I was in Atlantic City <laughs> when I was in my, like, 20 or something like that, and somebody did my numerology, and they told me that, what you just said. I'm remembering that. And I said, I have to wait that long? <laughs> I remember thinking that. I was like, Duff, I'm not gonna even make it to that age. Are you fucking kidding me? Do it now. But it's dawning on me that somebody told me that. How you know? are you not freaked out by that? Someone told you that you were gonna have this show when you were like in No, 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 they said you'll, you'll make right, it when you'll, you're right. a flifty. Right. <laughs> I'm making up a new age, I decided. <laughs> Chortily. It's, it's kind of... Swifty, yeah. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Um, I also wanted to ask you if you ever m mentioned anything, the um, Olivia Edward who plays Duke, who plays Little Duke on the show, her dad is John Edward. Did you ever talk to him about, like, here you've got this ghost, she's seeing the ghost. Yeah, uh, you know, that's, an, that's another uh, unbelievable thing, but... Um, I, I do something later on in the season that's that's kind of based on John. He's the psychic medium, you know, like crossing over with John Edward. So Olivia, when I met her, she was like this this high. And she's like, my dad talks to dead people. <laughs> I was like, cool. Um, but, you know, um, that that I didn't even, there was no correlation for that with White Rock. But um, they were so just taken in by the fact that she's the one who sees the other side. So, um, yeah, really cool. Um, I was wondering what your kids think, both your kids and your mom. Have they given you any notes? Of, particularly your mom, I'm curious what she thinks. Okay, this mom. is my mom. So my mom, she, she really lives next door to me. Okay, so anyway, I showed her the Phil episode. Did anybody see the Phil episode? Okay, two people. And so you and... Um, so it's, it's like this really intense episode, and she's, she's losing her, her shit. She's losing her way, and then she, uh, on purpose, steps in a hole and breaks her foot because she can't find her car. And so then she's in the hospital, and it's just like, it's just sad. Everything is just sad. It's devastating. And I'm, I'm watching it with my mom. I'm like, oh, fuck. I wonder what she's going to say about this. She laughed through the whole fucking thing. <laughs> she was like, oh, that's so bad. You know, when Phil steals the ring and Walter sees her or whatever, she thought it was hilarious, <laughs> which is just so funny to me. And then my uncle was mad. I heard my uncle was mad about the White Rock episode because you know you don't you don't say things like that in the family even though that's not exactly my family's experience but everybody's different you know it's it's the english side of my family <laughs> we're weirdos what about your girls what do they tell you and do they watch um you know uh my youngest daughter, Rocky, was in the editing with, room with me the whole, whole of season one, which was extremely satisfying. They do, uh, they watch and they're, 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 they're incredibly proud because they see their mom, um, you know, making this show. All, all of this, uh, uh, my life's work is coming into uh, focus in this one direction. And they're incredibly proud. They're inspired by it. They have voices in the show, um, and uh, their friends have a voice in the show, and they know that they're my inspiration as well. Um, it's it's an it's an amazing feeling to to be in that little coven. Yeah, absolutely. my husband, <laughs> my daughters, and my mom. Since there are so many things that echo your life and Sam and. You know, like you just said, Sam is is you in a cape. 
Is there any chance that in season, I don't know, eight, we will find out that Sam was at to pa pa two 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 that Sam was in a Grease Two esque movie? <laughs> well, I had Manish on the plane in the first episode say, I know you're rooster in Ching of the Mill. <laughs> So I'm like, <laughs> I've already blown that one. I do, I do little, I like to do little, you know, nods, little something for, for everybody. But I mean, I don't even know. Yeah, everything's game. Everything's copy like Nora Ephron says. That's right. Do you know what your final shot is of the show? Do you, or do you know where you're, are you someone who thinks this is where the story ends? Yes. You do. Yeah, it's in episode 12 of this season. <laughs> because that's, that's what, you know what I mean? I can't see beyond that because um, in the first place, I'm not picked up. And in the second place, is everybody here? <laughs> My network's here. Um, but I, 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 even if I had an idea, it would get upended because you could have everything locked and loaded and then I could walk out that door and something janky's gonna happen and that could be the final thing or the way I start season four or something like right. that. You know, it's, it's, it's an experience. It's, it's like life is happening every day. We gotta put that in, you know. But does the idea of living in Sam's skin, like do you feel like you could do that more? Um, yeah, I don't feel like it's that different than my skin. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, sure, sure, yep, I think I could. <laughs> All right, I want to take some audience questions um, from Jack. I love how you use the whimsical in your show mixed with such emotionality and guts. What led to the <coughs> dance sequence? Well, I, okay, so I was getting my roots done by my friend <laughs> at the salon. And while I'm getting, you know, while the colors is setting, we show each other, we play music and show each other videos that inspire us. And so she showed me Tilted, the Christine and the Queens video. And um, I watched it a couple times. I was like, man, that's weird. I like that. And it just grew on me. And so I became kind of obsessed with it. And, um, just rolling over in my head, rolling over in my head. I knew that I was gonna do it in the show and I knew that I was gonna do it with the girls. I, I knew that, I, I just saw it. And then I thought, how am I gonna do, you know, I think very literally, so I'm like, how am I gonna get a sound stage? How am I gonna get this black box and blue light with this huge stage and we could do fall offs? Like I wanted to do it so literally. Um, and then my production designers made this gorgeous stage. We did it outside. You could see the trees reflected in the floor. I kept it a secret from Mikey, you know, so, um, the, yeah. So her reaction was actually her reaction. Her, re yeah, yeah, that was, that. she, I was afraid she was going to be pissed. Like, why wasn't I in on this? Right. But, um, you know, uh, yeah, so I was. You're a good dancer. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm impressed. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, it took me three months to learn that. We got on this, I did secret choreography on the weekends. I would pick up Celia and I would drive us to the Debbie Reynolds dance studio in <laughs> Van, Van Nuys, California. And we danced for two hours and I was dead because I'd been working a whole week. So the, the day came to do that dance and we ran through it one time and I slipped my disc in my back. And so I could barely move. Like, if you see, I can't even, I'm so stiff. It's fun. Go back and watch <laughs> and see the pain. It's a fun exercise, a little activity. But, um, yeah, anyway. I think it I think the rigid, rigidity is yeah. the word. It kind yeah. of it worked. It worked for the moves. It was good. Um, I love the unique and delightful relationships you have with each of your daughters. How did you develop those, and why were they important to you? Um, so, well, you know, I have three daughters of a successive age, and so I based it on them. And then, you know, each of the girls, the actresses, 
um, Hannah, Mikey, and Olivia, they, they have their own things and their own um, strengths and then other abilities that would grow. So um, it's been really fun to see, for example, Hannah, who lives in the Bible Belt, you know, I, you know, she comes and she it, it is in a very close, tight religious community. And I, you know, she comes to do my show and she has to, in the last episode, say the word, stick her finger up her pussy. And I was like, it was so hard for me to, it's out of context, don't, don't worry. <laughs> it's really very tender, sweet moment, but. <laughs> And my character goes, I can't believe you just said that to me. And we were trying to talk our way around it, and I just adore her parents. God, I love Christians. I love them. <laughs> Way more than Jews. <laughs> so they were so understanding, we kind of talked ourselves. That's going to be the headline, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked through it, and, and it was just, you know, this isn't Hannah. This is an L.A. kid. You know, this is the way they talk. These things just come out of their mouths. They don't even think about it. You know, there's no shock value for the way kids talk anymore or, or um, get in their, their information. So, um, you know, she, so from season one to season two, her first day of season two was at the bar mitzvah when she's breaking me down. She's like, Sam, you should be a cleaning lady at McDonald's. You know, you have a bald spot. You look like Mr. Cohen over there. Like the whole thing. And she was so genius. And she just is, has been, like all of the girls, they just, you know, I, I leave them each season with a little bag of tools and they come back and they're just like all shredded and ready to go. It's like, it's been unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, isn't there that a showbiz thing? Like, don't work with kids and don't work with animals. You've got a monkey in next week's episode. I know, You're really, I know. you're breaking all the rules. <laughs> yeah. Had the that. monkey was scary. <laughs> the monkey brought the room down, let me tell you. Because I had fucking Sharon Stone, Kevin Pollack, Diedrich Bader, Rebecca Metz, Celia Emery, all the kids were all excited, here comes the monkey. Then the handler comes in. And it's like, it was worse than a two hour H&R meeting. They were like, <laughs> don't look at the monkey. Don't show your teeth to the monkey. Turn away from the monkey. Don't let the monkey know if you're, and I was like, are you fucking serious? And then it's like, so the whole, you'll see. On Thursday, we're all kind of like, hey, that's amazing. <laughs> and Sharon's like this, like, ooh, I love monkeys. <laughs> we're all fucking terrified. We're gonna get our faces ripped off by this fucking monkey if he sees one of our teeth. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so, Ness, as a non-binary person, Frankie's gender story at the end of season one really intrigued me. Was there a specific inspiration for that, and will it be explored more? Okay, so it was very, uh, for me, I needed to have uh, one kid uh, who was not proclaiming a gender, you know? And so I grew up, the the words were tomboy right. and androgynous. And then um, it became gender neutral. I did not want her, you know, when we started the show, she, her character's 12, you know? Um, and there's a big difference between gender and sexuality. Um, and I think people lump everything together. So um, at the end of season one, uh, they find Frankie in the boys' room at school, and she tells that story that I was referencing. Um, and I confront her about it because my other daughter says, Mom, Frankie's a boy. And she says, Mom, I wasn't in the boys' room because everybody says, I identify as a boy. No, it, it was the girls were being disgusting. And then Sam's like, yeah, middle school girls are bitches, which they are, <laughs> as every woman in here knows. Um, so it was important for me to, to keep that. After season one wrapped, somebody said to me, you need to get a trans advocate. And I said, why? Well, for Frankie. I said, why? Because she's trans. I said, what? I didn't, uh, I didn't know that. And I wrote the thing. 
it was massively important for me to just let this person be going through life. And I am so happy I didn't, because there are pressures. There is so much pressure because people need a label and an explanation. And that's another thing about my show is that I don't label it, I don't button it, I go into the next thing. And so, um, I mean, that's not anything, I, I, it's, she is who she is, but you know, like all of my kids in the house and all of their friends, they just, they don't even think about that. And, and they don't think about gender and they don't think about sexuality. It's all, it's all the same thing for them. It's very fluid. It, it's interesting because it th I think that what you just said is so accurate about the show. The show is just kind of living in the soup of life, you know? Yeah. And I think that sometimes people want to know What's the end game? So what is what's the defining thing then about Frankie? What what is, you know is she this is it? yes? And I need a clear description. And this show is not that. I mean, one like I feel like the log lines, which are honestly everyone should go and before the show airs, look at the log line for better things because right. there, it'll be like Sam does stuff or you know it's just like, it's the most. I don't want to give things away. No, but I think it's great because <laughs> it's just like, it's so perfect. It's like a, it doesn't say anything. Yeah. But it says everything. Um, Thank yeah, you. So absolutely. <laughs> um, can you tell me what your relationship is with your editors and at what stage do you weigh in on the cut of an episode? Well, my uh, season one, I had one editor. Two, I had two. This season I had three, which was amazing. Um, they started working the, the week we started production. They start getting everything in there. Um, so they'll do, the second I wrap, or if I have time on a weekend, I'll go in and we'll look at an assembly. And you know, usually my first reaction is um, nausea and I'm very upset. Because it's like, you know, you gave birth and like the nurse wiped all the lanolin off your baby's skin. And it's like, why'd you take the lanolin? Put the lanolin back. You know, don't, don't, don't tie off her umbilical cord that way or whatever. So it's, it's all of that stuff and it's, and it's releasing and then seeing the, the beautiful ways um, that they know how to tell a story. Um, it, it's, a learning process because, um, you know, like one of my editors was a, a comedy editor, and I was like, "Oh, this is not the tone of the show." You know, the tone, we're not going for laughs at all. We're going in the opposite direction, and you know, then you know another editor um, cutting together a sequence in a way that I wouldn't even touch it. You know, so, um, but we're we're there. The, I mean, comprehensively, you know. I mean, post is, is literally my favorite place to be. I have to be very careful when I'm in production. Um, I get a package uh, at the beginning of the day, and it'll say day 15, and then it'll have a breakdown of all the scenes that we're gonna shoot. And then by like day 29, I said to Sam, the guy who prepares my packets, I said, don't put the day on it because I'm short timing. Like I'm literally counting down to post and you can't do that. Right. You have to you have to enjoy every day that you're in the show. But post is so fucking the best thing ever. Oh my God. It's the best. As a director, are you a like many take director or no. are you like no? No. No. I mean, I really that is up to I want to honor whatever actor comes in. I want them to feel comfortable. I don't want them to think that I'm going to accept a take if it's not right. Um, so that's for, for acting. If there's something weird with, with lighting, we'll adjust it. Um, I, I, I know what I want my frame to look like, um, but I re I'm not, I don't want to do that. I, we're not into the uh, double digits of takes mm -hmm. at all. Um, I think we have time for one more question. As a fellow mom and career woman in entertainment in LA, I would love one to hear. I would love to hear. You got 59 seconds. Yeah. I would love to hear what your best advice is on how to be a, a good mom and 
to be successful. Okay. Good so mom is an oxymoron, y'all. Like, yeah. That's. Well, I, I have a saying that every mom is a single mom, whether she's married or not. Um, sorry, guys, or ladies. Um, and the thing that it takes to be a good mom and a successful mom is to work and model that for your children and to live a productive life because it's not enough to just be a mom because they're going to grow up and they're going to be gone and you're left holding an empty bag. So, you know, that's like what I say there's this dirty little secret. Your kids aren't enough. You have to live your best life to your most productive abilities. You did it. One second left. Say oh, yeah. Two. Say yeah. Oh, now the clock was going you up. You literally again. ended on 0 0.01. Are you serious? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. I want to thank Pamela Adlon so, so much. Better Things Season 3 is airing. It's just the greatest show. It's just the best. It really thank is. You. Thank you, Pamela. And thank, thank you, you all so much for coming. Thank you so much.